Second. First of all, I think we need to get out of the way, Corey. Who are you rooting for in tonight's game? Uh, Philadelphia. <laughs> no. oh. I know you get a reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three dog night. 1969, we heard about Sam Yasker, this most emotional presentation, so insightful. Uh, and he was talking about the things that were happening in 1969. What was Corey Wells and Three Dog Night doing in 1969? Uh, just missing stock. <laughs> Woodwood. Woodstock. Um, we, we were invited, but we, we just couldn't get out of a gig. I think we were in Chicago or something. We, were, we ended up doing the Miami Pop Festival, which was a, a, a one of the same thing. And then also we ended up doing the Denver Pop Festival and then a pop festival that was very similar to Woodstock in Pennsylvania with the, with the rain and mud and the whole it looked like a war zone. Uh, so we, did, we just didn't make it on that time, yeah. Your, your, your roots go back way, very far, but uh, specifically your relationship with, uh, uh, with Danny, it really goes to the Sunny and Cher show, right? Right. How did well, that work out? And actually, the Sunny and Cher tour, they, they were still touring it. And uh, she came into the Whiskey A Go Go. Um, when we were out, I was in another band called The Enemies, and, uh, and we were working the Whiskey A Go-Go, and in those days, uh, only the, the uh, celebrities and movie stars could rent the whiskey to do private parties. So Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor uh, rented the place out, and there was extremely, all these huge actors and actresses. I mean, I, Ben Gazzara was there, and uh, Jonathan Winters, and... Uh, uh, Connie Stevens, who I ended up working with later on, and, and Sonny and Cher. And when we were playing, Cher leaned up on the bandstand and whispered in my ear something which I can't repeat. <laughs> and, uh, and I then, love it when you do that. Yeah, and, then when, and then she came back a second time and said, well, we'd like to be, uh, we'd like to go on their Sonny and Cher tour. And of course I had to throw up my front and I said, uh, well, I have to ask my agent and my manager. Of course, inside I was going, yes! <laughs> so we ended up doing uh, we ended up doing that, and it was a uh, an array of artists that were on that who opened for her. It was like almost like a cavalcade thing. I think it was Dick Clark who actually put this thing together. So it was uh, uh, a group uh, called the Hard Times or the Changing Times. I can't remember. <coughs> which eventually, I was just telling Max, that um, it was Artie Cornfield and Steve Duboff, who were the two guys that were involved in Woodstock putting it together, or part of it. I really don't know what they did in it. But, um, and then also, it was us, and another single artist who had a regional hit out called Roses and Rainbows, which was Danny, my partner. Yeah. And because of that tour, we got to talking. We started throwing ideas around, and that was the inception of uh, Three Dog Night. What kind of ideas are you throwing around? I mean, you, you, your, your type of music is really distinctive. Uh, what were you talking about those early days? Uh, well, I mean, um, we're always looking for ideas. I was always an idea kind of guy. I always wanted to try something new, try something different. And uh, I actually had asked him once before if he wanted to uh, get together. And he said, no, no, he was strictly a solo artist and he doesn't do uh, he does not. He's not part of a band. Um, basically, Danny was a performer in his bedroom. <laughs> so, uh, and that's where he was sort of a record guy. So we got involved where he actually produced something, uh, a, a thing that my band, The Enemies, did called Hey Joe, which is the famous song made by Jimi Hendrix, but this was a faster version of it. And so he, he saw himself as a producer. You did some stuff early on with Brian Wilson, too, didn't you? Right. Uh, Brian was good friends with Danny, and, um, and we got into the studio with Brian, and Brian wanted to be a, a second uh, project for him or something or other. And uh, one, we, one day we were at, uh, at uh, Brian's house, and he was sitting at the piano playing, and we were all gathered around, and he was giving out harmony parts to us, which you would change. Uh, after you got it down and learned it, then he'd say, no, no, you're doing it wrong. I'm doing it wrong. I'm doing it like what you told me to do. He'd go, no, you have to do it like this. So, and then one day he stood up real and he going, Redwood, Redwood. And I had no idea what he meant, but he was, he says, your group should be called Redwood. And uh, we said, okay, Brian. 
Uh, well, ultimately, it wasn't. Uh, how, how did, what's the source of the name? The source came from a girlfriend of Danny's that he was living with at the time. Her name was June Fairchild. Uh, she was in a lot of Cheech and Chon movies, um, several of those. And she was, she was reading a book called Mankind and was reading about the Aborigines in Australia and uh, that they were they're sort of nomads and they would travel from place to place and sleep with a dog at night in a hollow or in a cave or wherever they went. Of course, the Australians got a hold of that and embellished it a little bit and <laughs> made it three dog night meant a really cold night. <laughs> Obviously, of the of the three dog night, you, there's the, the three leads. Uh, the other one's Chuck Nagrin. How'd you catch up with him? Uh, it was a, somebody that Danny. I, at that time, I was on the top of my game. I knew every single lead singer on the Sunset Strip. I just knew everybody. And Danny had met him at a party, and uh, and he was with Columbia, and he was known as Chuck Rondell at the time, and uh, he. Um, wasn't doing anything. He, his project got shelved by Columbia, and they were just, they would do that artist and kill somebody's career by just holding on to him. So um, Danny brought him and said, I met him at a party, and we had a meeting, and we sat down and talked. And, uh, and how do you know someone can sing by talking, you know? So I got up and I went to the piano and I started playing. He was from New York City, and uh, in the Bronx, actually. And I started playing these old 1950s. Uh, do up kind of things, and I say, do you remember this one? Do you remember Sherry and all that? Thing? And he would start singing it, and that's how we auditioned him. <laughs> <laughs> when you first decided, at some point, there was an aha moment, saying, "All right, we're, the three of us can 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 do this." And then there, you got to fill out the rest of the of the band, uh, and and go, decide to go to the next step. Is that a studio stuff, or did you decide? that you were going to cut some recordings in the studio, or did you decide you are going to be a live band? Well, th that was a conflict of, um, between Danny and I. He had this idea that we were going to sing with th this big, giant tape recorder behind us that was like seven foot tall with big <laughs> wheels on it. And uh, although, you know, it was a great idea at the time, but I said, that's not practical, and uh, we need to put a band together. We did. And I said, I have some band members that I know. And Jimmy lived next door. He was living in Jim Pond's house, and Jim Pond's was with the Turtles. And uh, it was Jimmy Greenspoon. Jimmy Greenspoon, right? Um, who just overcame cancer, incidentally. I just let you know. Yeah. Um, and so we we started putting. And Joe was in my band, and uh, who was the bass player, Joe Sherman. And he said, Yeah, he'd like to come along. Uh, and the last guy was. Um, Floyd, who Joe came to me and said, you got to go into the valley and hear this group called Heat Wave, this fabulous drummer, you've got to hear him. So we went into the club, we went into the valley, San Fernando Valley, and we listened to him, and then it was Floyd Sneed playing, and, uh, and he was with his brother, and we propositioned him, and he said yes, and he came with us. The guitar player was a little harder. The guitar player was a little tougher to find. We must have went through about five guitar players before. We had one guy named Ron. I can't even remember his last name, Ron, but great guitar player and great, but we played a place called The, Blank, the Bank in Pasadena, and we were doing a show, and I turn around, I hear this guitar player playing away, and I turn around, and there's nobody there. <laughs> and I'm looking around all over the stage, and he was hiding behind the amplifiers. So he had stage fright. Oh. He wouldn't. Uh... Beautiful for a live tour. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what happens is uh, Joe says, listen, there's a guy. We're rehearsing on Sunset and Vine. And, uh, and Joe comes and says, hey, man, there's a guitar player that I know from Modesto, California. He's next door in this mom and pop motel. And, uh, and, and he's with his band. And uh, we should go and talk to him. So Mike came over and. We said, would you like to play with us? He went, yeah, and he started playing, and we went, he's a great guitar player, and he had to go back and tell his bandmates, they had just came from Modesto to L.A. to get a gig, tell him that he's no longer with them, so Mike got a black guy. <laughs> but, but a long career. Yeah. Really, that was around 1968 then, time, time period. Yeah, about, about that time, yeah. And, you know, from the period of 1969 through 1974, no band had greater success than you did. You were in 
13 gold albums, 21 Billboard Top 40 hits, 7 went gold, uh, and for that five-year period, I mean, no band sold more records than Three Dog Night, which is remarkable. And one platinum. And, and you also did covers for some of the people who now, when you look at this list of songs and who wrote the songs, it's unbelievable. But for example, you know, Mama Told Me Not to Come was a Randy Newman song. Right. How did you kind of catch into that genre of, of even finding such talent like that? Well, well, it comes with the ear. Yep. You got to have the ear. And uh, actually, I found Randy Newman's album, his first attempt, uh, in a Sears of Roebuck bargain bin for 50 cents. Wow. And I saw that and I said, you know, this, this looks interesting. I, I, I got the album. Actually, I was doing that song before I was a Three Dog Night. I was in, in my band. And I played his album and I just fell in love with his uh, type of music, his style of music. Um, his cynical lyrics and, and whatever. And so uh, I, I actually brought that song three times to the other two guys because we had a you know, uh, diplomatic way of picking our songs two out of three. Um, and so and they kept turning it down. They kept saying, no, it's not a hit. It's not a hit. Um, but it was. Well, <laughs> yeah, number one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've seen you in concert on this particular song, and you go midway through into sort of a hip-hop piece, you know, uh, and are you, is, so you're obviously having a lot of fun. Is this designed to kind of reach out to a different audience, or is this something you're having fun with? No, and that's also satirical. I mean, it's, uh, it's just, um, I don't know, it's just something that I, actually, this is the third version of Mama Tomi. I always did other things in Mama Tomi. I would do a whole, uh, rapport of, of 1960s songs and say, ask the audience, do you remember this song? We would go into the Animals and uh, the Kinks and just all these different British invasion bands so that people remember, do you remember this, do you remember that? And then we would do it. And then it sort of metamorphosed itself into this thing where uh, I, I did it as tongue in cheek. It wasn't really serious. And, uh, and someone said, yeah, you should do that. You should keep doing that. So we just developed it and turned it into a rap thing. Mama told me rap. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it's unbelievable. He's, he's spectacular. You also did, you also, uh, Laura Nero, uh, Eli's Coming. Right. Hide Your Heart Girl. And, uh, that, uh, that, that song was brought to me by Chuck, who brought me that song. And he, he thought I would do a better job than, than him on it. And in return, I brought him Sunlight, uh, the Young Blood song, and told him he would do that better than me. So we were exchanging songs with each other once. I, I mean, really, how did that work? Did you? At some point, you, was there little, got to be a little envy factor, because somebody's going to be the lead. Right, right. But we weren't always, you know, everybody found their own songs. And basically, many times, you would find a song that really only you could do. So, or it was something that uh, the other two didn't really like, and I, I liked. I was on more on the R&B, uh, black kind of music stuff. What was your inspiration? When you were growing up, uh, was jazz a major part of your... Uh, Jazz was part of it. Uh, actually, jazz was uh, around in the mid-60s. Uh, jazz was a great influence in me. But my, my first starties were uh, I was born and raised in Buffalo, New York, and lived on the east side, which is a, looks like a war zone now. Um, but back then, uh, it was interracial, kind of almost to a certain point at a certain area. Mm -hmm. And I would walk to, uh, you walked every, everywhere in those days. And I walked to this roller skating rink that I would go I, uh, roller skating at, and uh, there was a Baptist church there. And I would listen to the music, and I would stop and sit down, and I'd probably blow about an hour and a half of just sitting there listening. And it would never end up going, you know, roller skating. But that's where my influences were. But uh, the artists that were influenced, uh, uh, George Lorenz, I don't know if anybody even remembers any of these people, but George Lorenz was known as the hound, the hound dog. And I think it was before, um, uh, um, oh God, I'm just, senior moment, folks. Um, this crowd has a lot of them, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you're looking at it right now. Anyway, he was the first. He was the first dog. Before Wolfman Jack. There was no, you know, I think Wolfman Jack got the idea of, of George Lorenz. And, uh, and he played all the rebel music, you know, the stuff that wouldn't go on the 
WKBW or any of the other major stations. And uh, so my, my influences were Bobby Blue Bland, Ray Charles, uh, you know, Jimmy Reed, Chuck Berry, all those people. Most of your music really is not political. Uh, and By design. Yeah, I just I was going to ask you this the question is clearly many of the things that Sam Yasger's dad hosted uh, was, was very political. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you decide to not be so political? Well, there were enough bands doing that already. Uh, every, we just decided that, uh, that we would just be piling on uh, to, 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 to join part of the thing, so we decided not to do that. Uh, we did. I, I picked songs that I had a, a, a quarrel with, and that was I was very much into environmental and cleanliness and clean and all that stuff. So out in the country and family of man, those are songs that are about you know cleaning up the environment, basically. Uh, and they gave me that. It was a given. They let me do that. But so you've nearly never been to Spain. No. <laughs> it was a chance. I, mean, I kind of like the music, but yeah. Actually, that we almost had that opportunity. We were on two years ago. We almost went to Milan. Do you, do you find that today? Are you, are you pretty selective as to what you uh, agree to do in music? Yeah. No, I just uh, even your touring. I mean, you're still after forty some years. Three Dog Night is, yeah. is out there. Yeah, I pick and choose uh, right now because. Um, you know, I'm up there in age, <laughs> and it's getting harder. It's not really the touring. It's I mean, I should say that it's not really the the performance on stage when you're there performing. Uh, that hour and a half or whatever it is is the fun part, and it's a great part. It's the traveling and getting there. It's the no meals, not eating for seven hours or eating crap food in the uh, airport somewhere or. The two-hour drives where you have to get up at four in the morning to get to the airport. It's that stuff that is draining, so we're cutting back. You, the first iteration, really from about six, 68 to, I think, 76, I mean, just success upon success, and then you decide that you want to take a break. Yeah, we're on a hiatus there for a while, 75. Um, well, the band, uh, with any success comes the pitfalls of success, and um, you become spoiled, or I have no idea, but uh, people just took liberties with their lives, and uh, it, it, it got to a point where Danny got fired, he got thrown out of the band, uh, Mr. Negron and his wife were both heroin addicts, and locked themselves in a hotel room in Atlanta, Georgia, wouldn't come out to do the show, and I, it, at that point it was just me and another uh, great performer, uh, Jay Gruska, who uh, wrote a lot of things for us, and uh, it, it just wasn't the same band anymore. It wasn't even the original musicians because we had the band that was Shaka Khan's band back in those days, and she she fired all the white guys, I guess, and uh, and uh, they came with us. And so it wasn't, it, the only people that were there was Jimmy and I, we were the only Guys, and I just said that it's not the original band, it's not what the idea was, time to quit. So we did, we quit. Did you go fishing then? Yes, I did. <laughs> I fished my brains out. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember uh, you, you became an editor for Outdoor Life. Yes, field editor. Field editor. So that means you're out there, you have to fish. You have to be out there fishing and you have to be there firsthand. Uh, how's, how's the fishing in Lake Erie? Fabulous. <laughs> Fabulous. Is that still an, an avocation? That's why I picked it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you go out there a lot? I mean, you use that avocation? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, in the winter, you know, I live in Los Angeles. I live in California. And when I come out uh, in the spring, which is now, uh, we live all summer long until late fall, right around Thanksgiving. Do you find that, <laughs> again, I'm going back to the, the, the cover songs you did for, like, uh, you did for Elton John, Hoyt Axton, John Hyatt, Harry Nielsen, when they were really, I mean, big names now, I can drop those names yeah, and everybody has recognized nobody heard them. <coughs> nobody had heard of them. Well, the story with Elton John is that uh, we got this demo uh, and we played it and, and everybody liked it. Everybody said, it's a great song. Um, let's do it. And we did. It was called Lady Samantha. And I said, who is it by? I said, by a guy named Elton John. I went, oh, cool. Well, it's a great song and so forth and so on. Well, at this time, in, 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 in the, in the moment, 
Elton John was just about ready to get out of the music business. He had been writing, trying to perform. He couldn't get anything going. He was living in England. He was ready to go to get a real job, eight to five. Um, and this song went on our album. The album went gold within a couple of months. And it put money in his pocket, which brought him back into the music business. And uh, he was very grateful at the time. So we, we went to England, and we worked there in several places. And, uh, and someone said, there's a guy here in the back uh, stage area who he says you did his song. He'd like to thank you and see you. And so uh, we said, yeah, we'll bring him back in. And it was Elton. And he had been standing out in the rain. He had a leather jacket on. I'll remember this. And his hair was all mushed down from the rain. And uh, he said he had another, he had, under his jacket, he had another demo for us. He wanted us to hear this other demo. And he gave it to Danny and he said, uh, I, you know, you should listen to this song. I think it's a great song. You could do a great job with it, obviously, because he's going to get paid for it. Um, so we took it back to the States where we said thank you very much and thank you for Lady Samantha and went back to the States, recorded it and got it ready, and it, but the album wasn't ready yet. And then all of a sudden we hear the song, your song, that he gave us on the radio by him. <laughs> We're going, wait a minute. So, and then... But you did it here in the United States, didn't you? We still put it on the album. We did, yeah. yeah. I mean, with, with, then you did Paul Williams, old fa an old-fashioned love song, and Out in the Country, and Easy to Be Hard. My gosh, uh, do these guys ever get back to you nowadays and say, Three Dog Night really sort of helped them? Yeah, Paul Williams has. Uh, Paul Williams has come. We did uh, Universal, and he came to that show. And we had him on stage, along with Hoyt Axton, who was a personal good friend of mine, or was. And... Um, so uh, actually, uh, Paul Williams, I had heard a song on, uh, in a commercial for a bank or a loan company who's one of the people that was performing it was, was John Travolta in his early years of, he hadn't been an actor yet, he was just doing commercials. And It's Only Just Begun was for the loan company. And then the Carpenters got a hold of that and then after that, way, I said, I recognize that guy. I know that song. And then he started sending us things, and of course we started doing the songs. As you reflect back now on, on your tremendous career, do, are there some songs that sort of got away that, that you had the first crack at and somebody else took? Yeah, several of those. Um, I can't think of them right now. But there, there, are, a bunch, uh, there are a bunch of songs that we turned down that, uh, well, I can think of one right now. We went down and saw a TV show that was just starting, and they offered us to do the song for the theme for the show, and and the other two guys said, "Nah, it's too negative. It's it's a uh, you know, it's Vietnam and all that kind of stuff." And it was for Mash. <laughs> <laughs> Suicide is painless. <laughs> A little, more, a little bit more of a serious note, uh, Sam talked about, of course, music as being a, a powerful form of speech and things referencing We Shall Overcome. As you were listening to, to Sammy Asger talk about just the First Amendment and, and, and your extensive career, do you, do you find that that's a, a, you know, a vehicle which you think has really made some change? Well, yeah, I think what the people were saying then were uh, the they apply to today. I mean, there's still many things. I mean, the only thing that I'm a little confused about is that um, back then it was fashionable. It was, the young people thought it was fashionable to be against the war. Um, the young people today, I think, are for the war. Yet, and it's, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it's a clash of, of beliefs right there. Because uh, back then it was, you know, you if you were against the war, you were cool, and now you've got like you brought up the those people who uh, were protesting. I think they went about it wrong. I mean, I think it was terrible. You never do that to someone who's grieving. Uh, but they were they were making a statement, you know, about being in the war. But it was another time, another generation. <laughs> do you miss that time and that generation? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Who doesn't wish being young? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Speaking of which, uh, I, I, I can monopolize uh, Corey for forever, but any questions from the crowd with regards to
Corey Wells and, and Three Dog Night and Mama Told Me Not to Come or One Is the Loneliest <laughs> Number or anything like that? Yes? Will you be in Chautauqua again? Yeah. Playing at the... Yes. Uh, I'm sure if they ask us, we'll definitely be there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Great candlelight. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> you were in Chautauqua about three, four years ago, five years ago? Yes. I, I noticed that uh, the piece that we pulled here was we played with the Nashville Symphony. Yeah. which was really a cool, wonderful uh, DVD. Is, is that something that you found challenging to, to work with the symphony? Um, at first it was, yeah. Well, actually the whole idea was sitting around in the agent's uh, office one day and talking, what can we do? And, what da -da 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 -da. and then the agent said, well, why don't you do uh, a si sing with a symphony, with the London Symphony? Or no, it's just symphony. And then we went, yeah, well, yeah, well, how about the London Symphony? Yeah. And then it just started, you know, snowball. And then we had the idea to go to London and perform with the London Sym Symphony Orchestra. And uh, we recorded at uh, Abbey Road. Was very, exci <laughs> very excited about that. I had to see Studio Two. I just had to see where all that magic was in there. Um, it's a terrible studio. Does anybody know about Abbey Road where the Beatles recorded? Uh, it was a strange studio. The council is on the second floor. The glass window that you're supposed to be looking at the artist through is, is, sees a wall. They're down below. So they never saw each other. They had to converse through the microphones. And in those days, they didn't have a microphone like this. You had a microphone that was down it, pointing the amplifiers. So when you had to talk, you had to bend down and talk. Talk to the microphone and the amplifier. How, how unusual, I mean, to do that. But some fabulous stuff came out of that studio. Incredible. Yes? The, the song Liar, was that a song you guys wrote? I'm trying to recall if that was a song you covered. Did you, did you guys write that song? Uh, no, we did not write that song. The song was done by a group called Greyhound um, out of England. This is Danny's form of, of finding songs. He would go to England and get the top records that were played there because many, many times what's being played in England is not being played here and vice versa. So he would get a song that was a hit in England, bring it back, and then we would record it. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> There was also a sense at the time that people didn't want their music to be used commercially. And now we're of a generation where Madison Avenue has just run wild with the songs of our generation. How do you feel about all that? Um, it doesn't matter because if they're not playing your stuff, uh, you at least get, you get it on the thing. I think the Beatles were uh, really adamant about not having that done, but yet they're doing it now. You, you hear a lot of that stuff, so it doesn't matter. We've got so many things that they've used our songs, so many commercials. Uh, matter of fact, just recently uh, there was a movie out called Marsney's Moms, and they had Mama Told Me in there uh, in that movie. But we've been in, you know, The Big Chill, and I, I can't even, there's so many, G.I. Jane, there's just a lot of, a lot of different things, and then plus Beer commercial, Shambhala used. So, it's good. I get a check. Yeah, I was just going to say that. We're out there checking. <laughs> How does that work? I mean, the reality is you've, you've signed with an agent. I'm not telling you anything. <laughs> oh, gosh. Some, somebody handles all that. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. And I, I just, all they do is get my address and they send it to me. Yeah. You want the, they just want your SS number, and that's it. Yeah, they, they usually go to the William Morris, who we're with now, um, and they'll, they'll ask us, say, we're, we're looking for an artist, we're looking for a song. Sometimes they don't even know who the artist was. They say, we like this song, we love it. Who did it? We'd like to use it. And then the booking agency, the agent will say, oh, well, that's that band, and this is how much they want. <laughs> and this is how much we want. Are you writing now new stuff? Yes. We're, um, I'm writing some stuff. Uh, for a new CD that's supposed to be coming out in 2025.
but no. <laughs> the way my partner works, it's very feasible. Um, yeah, we're putting some things together, but we're, uh, I'm writing some songs, and that's the next step in the, you know, evolution of my business, is to actually write some songs that uh, actually hits, they are becoming hits. I mean, uh, we, we're not uh, kidding ourselves. There's no way we're ever going to have a hit record again. It's just, it's past. But, uh, but it'd be nice to have a song that someone recognizes and knows uh, of our generation uh, that would uh, appreciate what, what we're writing. And we're doing some things. Uh, my idea was to, what would Three Dog Nights sound like if they were in the 80s or the 90s? Mm -hmm. So we're doing those, we're doing cover songs of that, of that generation. How do they sound? Great. Uh, <laughs> actually, we're doing one now called Heart of Blues on stage. And uh, Danny's doing, Danny's brought one. Great, I love this song. Uh, it's called Prayer for the Children. And uh, we're doing that on stage too now. Do you have a website? Anything these people can kind of follow, Three Dog Night? ThreeDogNight.com. So it's probably pretty easy. Yeah, you would think so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> any, any more questions? Yes. Yeah, Randy. On your iPod. <laughs> you assume I have an iPod. <laughs> um, uh, just an array of people, just different artists. Um, I don't. I don't stick with just one artist. Maybe. Maybe the Beatles. Maybe. I'll. You know. I know most of their material, but uh, I would say uh, just an array of different people, starting from the '60s up until year 2000. You know. Dave Matthews. I love Dave Matthews. They're very, very good. Is your word up there? How has things changed business-wise between this newer CD you're doing and how things work back? There the procedure and recording? Oh, no, not the technology? As far as oh. getting it all going and once you get your songs ready, has the there a big change in all the channels you go through and everything? Or is it basically the same as it was? It kind of is. Even the young kids, they got to follow that format. They, they can't get out of that. Uh, it's the same thing. You, you go into a studio or wherever you go. Today, you don't have to go in a studio. You can do it right in your basement, which I do now. Uh, and you, you put together a thing, and then you've got to market it you know, through that. Hopefully, that a record company will, will buy it from you. But the record companies are struggling now because the invention of the Internet. It's... So they, they don't have that grip that they had in one time where they took 80 and gave you 20, you know, that kind of thing. If you were lucky. <laughs> More questions? If not, one of the great things about Three Dog Night, one of the great things about Corey Wells is, is obviously sharing here today, and I really, really appreciate it. But I want to conclude on what I think is the song of Three Dog Night, which in fact bridges every gap possible. And if we could play that now, and, and Corey, you don't have to feel like you have to start singing, but it's okay. And everybody else, I want to <laughs> everybody else can kind of join in here. Ah, yeah. yeah. It's okay. You don't have to. It's okay. It's not in your contract. I do it every night. <laughs> I'm not singing. Feel free. I just had to get a book. No. Joy. Joy to the Citizen. <laughs> 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 
signed if you're interested stop up uh, uh, and feel free to pick over the front table there. thank you Corey you're welcome. Thank you for telling me to do that. I didn't even think of it. You were very smart. I just, it just. 